This video is about making accurate RF measurements. SimSmith is a great standalone program to help understand many RF topics, and this is how some people will use SimSmith. However, if you also wish to use SimSmith to build or design anything physical, the need to make RF measurements becomes apparent. This video is about making measurements and using SimSmith to better understand how to improve these measurements in the high frequency and VHF frequency ranges. In 2011 and again in 2015, some friends of mine participated in sort of an RF impedance measurement challenge with the goal of improving our measurement uh, skills. Web uh, page links to the former uh, uh, challenges and the technique used in these challenges are provided below the video. Some of the previous material will also be included in this video from those previous challenges. Making accurate RF measurements is a function of several things. First, the user's understanding of RF concepts is incredibly important. Second, the user's care in making the measurements is equally important. Third, and not easily controllable, is the dynamic range and the quality of the hardware making the measurements. This is something you can't really do anything about, but um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of equipment can be made better uh, within the limitations of the equipment itself. Fourth, software of the device making the measurements. This is incredibly important. Things like user calibration, line extension, and the ability to save files in a format that uh, SimSmith can read. And fifth, the calibration standards used uh, to, make the, to do the calibration. These vary in price from uh, virtually nothing to uh, incredibly expensive. The picture shown on the screen right now is some ones that I've made, which are, um, you know, the, the price of those is probably not much more than the cost of the bare connectors. Uh, the measurement plane in, on, on these B and C ones is, is defined by that black line there. The measurement plane on these B and C connectors is clearly the back surface of the connector. On these SMAs, clearly the back surface of the connector. In the case of this end connector, the measurement plane is that ring right there. In the case of this end connector uh, short, it's right there. Also, you can see where it is. Um, on the other hand, here's a very expensive set of uh, calibration standards uh, that uh, fortunately I was lucky enough to buy an analyzer that came with a cal kit. And uh, this cal kit was worth more than the analyzer, and I'm not sure that... Uh, the people who sold it to me realized it had the cal kit with it, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it's a, a three and a half millimeter cal kit, which is which is uh, compatible with SMA connectors, but it's incredibly precise, and um, consequently, it's in, in, it's out of the means um, price wise uh, for most people. And I wouldn't have bought it myself if it hadn't come with the analyzer. Anyways, um, we finally need a way also to verify the measurement accuracy that we make. It's one thing to say, uh, do this and you'll get better accuracy, but when you're all said and done, you need a test to prove that you've actually gotten that accuracy. And the concept of a reference plane is where the VNA is calibrated to make accurate measurements. This is analogous to making a DC resistance measurement uh, where you zero out the lead resistance of the meter making the measurement. However, the VNA needs to calibrate out the magnitude and phase for all frequencies. So it's a much more complicated process, but it's analogous to, to getting rid of the um, what's in between where you make the measurement and the meter itself. There are primarily two types of measurements we make. The first type of measurements is when we make the measurement within a transmission line, and the reference plane is defined as the interface between two connectors. The definition of what that interface actually is, is is defined. The major manufacturers all know about it. Uh, it's typically the flat surface between uh, two connectors if there is one, although connectors like B and C and N connectors don't have a flat surface. It is defined for the N connector. I'm not sure exactly where it's defined at, um, and I'm not sure if it's defined for the B and C or not. It's uh, not nearly as important uh, for the lower frequency connectors, but uh, uh, that's where, that's the one type of measurement. The second type of measurement is when you make a measurement on a component. And there really isn't a reference plane at this point. Uh, you'd like to believe that there's a reference point right at the connector, uh, not the connector, the right at the connection where you t uh, connect to this component. However, though, that would imply that you would have a calibration 
um, standard that would fit there. And that becomes part of the problem as the size of the components can be, uh, you know, fairly large sometimes and you won't have any way to be able to um, uh, calibrate to that place, uh, to that plane exactly. Nevertheless, uh, that shouldn't uh, deter us. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do to basically uh, make our measurements uh, fairly accurate and SimSmith can help us along the way uh, to really understand this well. Let's start by answering why it might be important to actually make RF measurements. Let's uh, assume for a moment that we're going to simulate an antenna. We're going to simulate it in something like Easy Neck, and let's assume it's, um, this is good, 10 meters. Um, we're going to assume the impedance is 20 plus J40 at the frequency. And it's sitting up um, on a tower or in the trees or somewhere else, it doesn't really matter, with 100 feet of transmission line. Um, I'm going to use just the default transmission line, which is a half a dB loss per 100 feet at 10 megahertz, velocity factor 0.6667. We see our starting impedance here of 20 plus J40 down here, and we see our ending impedance right here being 94 plus J68.37. So, when we simulated this, did you include all the nearby metal metallic objects, insulation on the wire, taper on the elements if it's a self-supporting like aluminum structure, uh, do you simulate the ground correctly? All these things will affect this initial starting point. Uh, the insulation on the wire is not easy to, to always figure out what it is. Most plastic insulations have dielectric uh, constant of somewhere around four, could be a little higher, could be a little lower. That'll certainly affect the length of the antenna somewhat. We have, a, we have a variation right here on our initial guess. In addition to that, this green spiral here is due to the, due to the 100 foot of transmission line. What if the transmission line didn't exactly have a velocity factor of 0.6667? I mean, coax is not exactly a precise um, material. So let's make it be a velocity factor 0.66 and see how much that changes things. Let me set this back to 100 again because easy because uh, uh, Smith, Sim Smith uh, keeps the uh, the length the same in degrees. Okay, so now we're down to here. So let's put the splat right. Let's see if we can put the. Uh, I can't put the splat there, but let's uh, with the marker there. Let's um, just leave the marker there. Notice I'm just about at the just about at the um, on the axis right here. If I go and make this 0 0.67, and again set this to 100 feet, I'm quite a ways away from where I was before. This is a big change in impedance, all due to the fact that I don't know exactly the precise velocity factor of the cable. What if I do know the velocity factor of the cable, but I don't get the length quite right? There's 100 feet. What if, I, what if I'm off by one foot, one way or the other? These are some big changes in impedance. To, to be using this as in, the, in the rest of our calculations, it'd be nice to know the answer considerably more accurately than, than what's shown here. So hopefully this has convinced you that uh, there's a need for making measurements. And number two, if you want to make measurements on components, you have to measure them. There's no simulation to be done. I mean, the best simulation you can do on a component is if it says it's 50 picofarads, just put 50 picofarads in there. Uh, you have no idea whether or not there's resonances in that, cert in that uh, component that, um, you know, the first, first resonance in a capacitor is a series resonance, so the capacitor becomes incredibly good looking um, at some frequency, it becomes, you know, its impedance drops and in the case of an inductor, it's a parallel resonance is the first resonance, and it becomes a very high impedance circuit there. Uh, the effects of those things as you get closer to, to those resonance points uh, change the component a lot. I mean, it's, it's important to know these things, and the only way to really know them is to make a measurement. So I'm convinced, but uh, you know, hopefully you, I can convince everyone else that it's important to be able to make measurements. And if you're going to make measurements, it's nice to make them with a reasonable degree of accuracy. About six or seven years ago, there began to be a lot of little network analyzers that were available that allowed us to make impedance measurements. And these little, these little network analyzers basically made 
the ability to make these measurements within the price range of a lot of people who would you would consider to be hobbyists. However, giving somebody a tool that can make accurate measurements and getting them to use it properly isn't always um, isn't always a foregone conclusion, to say the least. So in 2011, I was sharing some data with people, and it wasn't going very well. Uh, in the process of trying to share data, their data didn't match my data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I started thinking about what could we possibly do to make this be a little bit more predictable. Not thinking that the devices themselves were at fault, but thinking that operator was the uh, operator or the um, uh, let's, just, let's leave it at operator. The operator is probably the fundamental reason of there was a problem. So I was looking around to see if I could make some very accurate little um, devices that I could send to some people and let them measure them and see what what differences we got. And I came across um, a website from the guy in France who uh, I befriended sort of. He works for CERN, and he had done the exact same work I was doing at the same time. Uh, he had done it a year or two earlier. But he took a bunch of surface mount resistors. These were 1206 resistors, and 1206 is a pretty nice size because it's big enough you can solder wire to the end of it and stuff, and, in, and yet it's still small enough it has good RF, RF performance. But if you look at this chart, it's very interesting. This is a, pl a plot of the attenuation of a single resistor in a 50 ohm circuit. And we notice that a zero ohm resistor at high frequencies you get a little loss. A 100 ohm is pretty flat out to, out to several gigahertz. And then all the other resistors, they all have roll off at the high frequencies. What that means is, the small res all these components have a basically the same chassis that holds the resistor, the same um, uh, 1206 body. There's going to be a capacitance between the end caps on on the on the device, and the and the device itself will have a small amount of inductance. What we're seeing here is a small amount of inductance, virtually the inductance being almost canceled out completely by the little bit of capacitance, and all these cases down here for resistance values, the capacitance dominates. So anyways, it looks like a 100 ohm resistor is a pretty, gar pretty darn good resistor up to several gigahertz uh, by itself. Anyways, so I made some measurements and I got measurement that matched his measurements almost exactly. Uh, I made it with my big um, HP analyzer, but uh, it didn't matter. Um, the bottom line is all 1206 parts have about 0.05 picofarads across, across the component. Given that... Um, 0.05 picofarads across the component, and given the fact that we're going to uh, want to spread this around, as long as the resistors are the same resistance value, and you can buy resistors in you know fractional percent accuracy, uh, it's pretty easy to um, to give uh, components to people to let them measure. So basically, I did that, and this goes on about what what I measured and how I did it and stuff. And I'd encourage people to look at what, what's here. But the bottom line was. It was pretty easy to measure components up in the or to the order of several kilo ohms up at 100 megahertz uh, pretty accurately. And of course you have to look, compensate for things and you have to be careful about what you're doing. But this was a very, um, a very interesting and eye-opening um, experiment. It was a lot of fun. And then it was done again um, uh, in 2015. Of course in 2015 I had learned to make measurements a lot better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, again, this is the this is the model of the 1206 package. I found a, um, a paper written by AVX that has this exact model in there, almost exactly. They th they thought it was 0.052 picofarads, um, but nevertheless, I put the, uh, the resistors in a little fixture again to make a measurement of them. I got the same roll off I got before. I got 0.055 picofarad. Part of that was due to the fact that. Um, I had a, these leads connected to the end of fairly large leads, which will increase the capacitance just a little bit because the lead actually went past the end cap a little bit. Um, anyways, this is the other um, document, uh, but uh, I was able to do, was able to make several values um, uh, of resistors. We did 100, 100 ohm, one kilo ohm, sorry, 10 ohms, 100 ohms, a kilo ohm, and 10 kilo ohms. And was able to compensate for them. And I even was able to build a, a standard component like this. This is a small 1206 component. This is a 10K resistor with a piece of 22 gauge soldered to the end caps. It's, I don't know how long it was, two, two and a half inches long, something like that. But it became a standard part that we could use to figure out what the effect of 
of this was that I couldn't uh, calibrate out. And that was very interesting to do. And uh, SimSmith does his stuff for us, just um, does his stuff very well for us. Anyways, en enough of that at the moment. But um, fundamentally, if we know what the resistor is, and it's good, we can go to a website like EEWeb here, and we can see that 22 gauge wire, which is 25 mils in diameter, a 2.2 inch long piece of that wire is 57 nanohenries. So we can use that 57 nanohenries in series with our resistance value. In, in, and of course, it's in parallel with the capacitance too. And we can use that as our quote standard capacitor. And hopefully this is making sense. This drawing shows three different setups that try to explain the concept of reference plane. Let's look at the bottom one first. On the bottom one, we have basically a network analyzer with a connector on the output of it. And the sex of the connectors doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what type connectors or anything else. But we've got a network analyzer that comes with a connector. We have a mated connector here, a piece of cable, another, it's a male in this case. And, and we have a female calibration standard. It's a homemade calibration standard. It's got open short load right on the end of it, kind of like the flanged uh, SMA and BNC connectors I uh, showed earlier in the picture. And basically, we're gonna, I'm going to assume that our net network analyzer has software capable of calibrating to a reference plane. So we tell the network analyzer to go into the mode to calibrate. And it asks for open, shorter load, or maybe it gives you the choice of which what order you do them in, but it doesn't really matter. Maybe it gives you a choice of the load resistance. Instead of being 50, you can, you can select it. It doesn't matter again. But you, you satisfy what it's asking for. So it asks for one, it asks for, for one of the, one of the, um, standards to be put in there. And you scan it over frequency and it keeps the data. And then you do it again and again. And it takes all the data and converts that to a, basically, a set of equations that make the new reference plane no longer here, but makes a reference plane here. Then you decide that you want to make a measurement. Well, our reference plane is here. It's really defined as being somewhere here. If you were to plug this cable into a product you buy and you wanted to measure its impedance, this is the right place to be measuring it. This arrow does not show right in the middle of the connector for a very simple reason that the definition of where the reference plane is between connectors is not always obvious. In the case of like an SMA connector or the case of a, um, uh, you know, like a, um, a, the APC flat connectors, the sexless connectors, I, it's very definitely the dielectric is the, is the reference plane, but something like an N connector, which has no easy place to define where it, where it exists. Uh, there is a definition. I don't personally know what it is, but nevertheless, um, you need to get it to that point um, if you want to make the measurement very, very accurately. So we need to move the reference plane from here to the correct place. This little uh, um, calibration standard that you built could be very short, and it may be inconsequential to need to move it. It could be very long, too. It could be it could be two, three inches long. wouldn't matter. It should be moved. And we can move it. Sometimes the network analyzer itself will allow you to move it. Uh, in a 50 ohm cable system, they assume that this is a 50 ohm structure and they will do something called software line extension. And if you do line extension, uh, it's a negative value in their case because they're moving the cable, they're moving the load towards the VNA. SimSmith can also do it by adding positive transmission line length. I mean, SimSmith is better to do, better to do it than the VNA because it can, it can, uh, have this be any impedance at all. This could does not have to be the same impedance as the cable. But nevertheless, that's kind of how you make, uh, how you calibrate an, a network analyzer. <clears throat> then, moving up a step, sim similar, similar type of um, circuit. However, this is a calibration standard that's a high quality calibration standard. It turns out that the high quality ones with a network analyzer that's capable of understanding what these are, does this reference plane movement automatically. Which is kind of, uh, it's kind of disconcerting the first time you run into it. So you put an open on here, you cal it, and when you're done, let's say the open was the last thing you did, then you do a sweep, uh, then you look at the uh, Smith chart after the cals, and it shows that it's not an open anymore, it shows an arc. And the arc is because it moved the reference plane here, and then we still had the open at the reference plane in the, in the, um, in the cal standard. But it moves it automatically for you. So it takes all that work away from you. You don't need to do it. 
but that only applies to the higher, uh, much higher, um, you know, dollar uh, network analyzers. Again, you can use a calibration standard such as this with, uh, uh, if you happen to have one, you can find them on eBay or something. Let's suppose you get one of those. It's a little bit longer distance perhaps to move than one you might make yourself. Doesn't really matter. Moves the same way though. Finally, we have a case that's pretty common, something I do all the time, and that's want to measure components. And it's a similar type of a thing again. We have the network analyzer. We have a cable. This cable has connectors on the end. This last connector is just a, just a, it's shown as a female connector, but it's got some wires sticking out. They're two inch wires. For the moment, I'm going to define this as this two inch wire as a two inch piece of 250 ohm velocity factor 0.9 transmission line. We're going to pretend that we don't know it, but yet we do know it. And uh, that'll become obvious in a minute here. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make a measurement on a component that sits right at the end of these wires here. And we're trying to do it in a way that's accurate. So if our network analyzer was calibrated to reference plane A here, right at the network analyzer, we'd have to compensate for the effect of the 24 inch piece of 50 ohm cable. This is velocity factor 0.7 is like Teflon cable. We then have to would also have to compensate for this little thing here, this little V-shaped thing to, that gets the wire spread apart far enough to be able to get across the component. If we had calibrated the network analyzer to this point through, again, down our loads down here like we did before and moved, to, moved our reference plane to here, we would then only need to compensate for this piece of it in the circuit. The very best way to do it, of course, is to calibrate all the way to the very edge. Calibrating to the very edge, though, implies that you have an open short load that you can put across here. I don't know how to make a 50 ohm load that fits across this two inch gap or whatever it is. I don't know how to make a short that fits across it. I don't know. How, an open's probably not too hard to do at lower frequencies, but the short looks inductive, of course. If any key piece of wire, even if it's a flat piece of copper, um, you know, inch wide copper, it still has some inductance and the resistor will have some inductance too. And that may not work with your network analyzer's calibration. So we need to figure out a better way of doing that. So let me continue here. And this is, this is pretty cool. SimSmith can do a lot of really cool stuff to help you along uh, these lines. So what I'm going to do is here on the left hand side before this isolation block, here's what we really have. We have a five ohm resistor and I, I'm going to make this the same length as in the previous example where I said it was 57 nano Henry's for a two inch long piece of uh, number 22 gauge wire. So what I put in here is a five ohm resistor right in the center, a little 1206 five ohm resistor. Um, then I put an inch and a inch and 1.1 inch and 1.1 inch of uh, 22 gauge wire. And I solder these or I connect these right to the very ends of those wires. So this is effectively a two inch or so gap. And this is my component. So L1, so let's get rid of everything on the Smith chart here. Okay, L1, this arc right here represents our component as swept from one to 100 megahertz. That is our component. It's no longer a fixed value, but it doesn't matter. That's our component. And we want to get our network analyzer to read that same value. Or we want to be able to use, let's just say we, we want to be able to use SimSmith to, to use that value. So what we'll do here is we take the, we take what was generated as a component. We're going to, we're going to cheat right now for a moment and know that it's point, that this piece of um, transmission line here is two inches right here, two inches of 250 ohm 0.9 velocity factor. It's, it's air dielectric, just wires. And this may not be a, an exact, this may not be exactly what it is, but it doesn't matter. I'm saying that's what it is for the moment. Just, just go, you know, bear with me here. And then we're going to add onto that 24 inches of uh, this transmission line right here. So the point at reference plane A, what we will see at reference plane A is T2. So this is the this is what the network analyzer would actually measure. So this is an important concept. So let me re reiterate this a couple times here. The network analyzer measures this. That's really not the right value. What we want to do is we want to see this value. This this is a function of frequency, but it sees it sees the red curve. So this 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 isolation block. What I did is I just put this in here just to show what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this impedance right here and put it back over on this side. But effectively what I've done here is pretty simple. I've taken the impedance that existed on the left, uh, right hand side of T2 here. And I've just put the real part in ohms and the, and the imaginary part in J ohms on this part. This is exactly 
exactly equivalent to me making a network analyzer measurement and taking the file that I get from my network analyzer and putting it in the file location right here. That's exactly equivalent to that. So now, let's assume for a moment that this is all out of the circuit and this is the loaded file from the network analyzer. We know it's wrong, but we're going to correct for it in SimSmith. So the first correction we do in SimSmith is move the reference plane back out here. Oops, I shouldn't have done that. Move the reference plane back out here. We do that by minus 24 inches of whatever transmission line it type it is. And we know that pretty accurately because it's probably printed on the cable. Then we're going to try to do something here to get our curve to match what we expect it to be. So let's keep L1, the curve here at L1 point, and that's the exact impedance of the real, the real circuit. Let's get rid of this and let's look at the generator for a moment. Now, generator matches it perfectly since I just happened to have cheated, but I don't know what this is. So let's not cheat. Let's just, let me, let me, let me say I think it's three inches long and it's not two inches. Let me say I think it's, I don't know, 150 ohms or 120 ohms. And that's clearly wrong. What I'm going to try to do here is make this, I'm going to adjust the length of this, the impedance of this, and I'm going to try to make this match this other curve. When I do match it, then that will be exactly what this really was. So I'm hoping this is all making sense. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change its length, and I can see the effect, and I'm trying to match it both at the end point, the end point and some other points along the way. So it's shown right now, it sweeps from 1 to 100 megahertz, and 30 megahertz is shown as a circle in the middle. So I'm going to sweep this down a little ways. should probably zoom in here some. And... We can see that the, the curve here, the blue, the, um, the purple curve is on the outside of the blue one. So this is not high enough impedance. So we can just, just raise the impedance on this here. Now we need to increase the, or decrease the length. Oops, decrease the length some here. We're getting closer. Raise the impedance more. Decrease the length a little bit more. Oops, decrease the length a little more. Raise impedance. Raise impedance again. And there it matches. And notice it matches in the center point too here. So it matches at the starting frequency. It matches, matches at the starting frequency in both cases. It matches at the, at a center point and also matches at the end. So, if we take the file that we load into SimSmith and we apply these two transmission lines to it, that effectively means that this impedance here at T4 is exactly what was at this point right here. And then we can use it as we wish within SimSmith. And this is a pretty powerful thing to do because we it allows us now to put this little factor, you can save this away. You can put, make this as a ruse block, these two pieces. You can make them as an in block. Wouldn't matter. You could call them, um, you know, you save this little device here and you, you, um, you could have it done if it's bent. The wires could be bent 45 degrees. They could be bent at 90 degrees. You could have two different versions of this or whatever. And your match won't be as good as my match because my match was, was obviously, I cheated. What's real, what this thing really looks like is a small piece of transmission line of one impedance and a small piece of transmission line of slightly lower, higher impedance and again and again and again. But if this is a fairly short length, this works amazingly well in order to get very, very accurate measurements. So now I have the ability to measure a component that's say two, two and a half inches long. I could also do this to measure a component that's four inches long or six inches long. The longer I make these components, the harder it is, of course, to compensate for it, et cetera, et cetera. And if I had been doing this, I would have probably not let the reference, not let the reference plane be here. I would have calibrated the reference plane out to this point just because. And then I would have used, I would, and then I would have had a component that would be this compensation. And again, it's negative, of course, uh, because we're, we're going, we're trying, we're moving the reference plane towards the load. And that's what we're trying to do in this case. Um, so anyways, um, this is, this is very cool, um, to say the least. And it's a very powerful feature 
uh, that SimSmith can help us do this kind of stuff. And it, al it allows us to make more accurate measurements. And the accuracy of the measurements we make um, in, you know, ultimately uh, means we, we can build something better and we can understand it better too. A couple more things before I finish. If you build components similar to what the bottom component here sh shown, where it's, this is, represents 22 gauge wire that's soldered just to the end caps, you can pretty much get 0.05 picofarads uh, across the component very, very easily. However, if you put it on a little circuit board, with the amount that the circuit board extends past the end cap and the width of it, this will increase the capacitance significantly. So if you choose to make a standard component like this, uh, just be just be aware of the fact that it's a little bit higher capacitance. You have to compensate for that. And also, it, this will have lower inductance. This inductance of basic wire is known pretty accurately. The inductance on your circuit board can be calculated, but it will be different. It doesn't make this component better or worse than this component. They will still be, they will still be repeatable, they'll still be usable, and there'll be no problem doing it. I just did it this way. I have several of these floating around with different length wires on the end when I was doing stuff. If you break one, it's no big deal. Uh, the service mount components are dirt cheap. Um, I bought a reel of, oh gosh, I don't remember. I think it was a a 10, 10 K ohm, 5,000 parts, 10th percent. It was like 20 bucks. Um, I've got like 4,900 of them still left. Um, but, um, you know, the point, the point is that um, it's pretty easy to come by a surf the service mount parts. If somebody really can't get a hold of them, I've got tons of them. I just kind of wasn't in them, kind of didn't want to be sorting them out and, and you know, sending them out all over the place. But uh, if people real, if somebody really needs them, I'll be glad to send you some. Uh, on the other hand, um, you don't have to use the values I used. You know, that's just representative of stuff. Uh, assuming you have an ohm meter to measure the actual R on them, they could even be five percent parts. It wouldn't matter. Uh, if you don't have 1206s, you could use 0803s, slightly different capacitance, not much different though, actually. An 0803 is a little narrower, but it's a little narrower this way too, so the capacitance doesn't change hardly at all. Um, it's harder to solder the wires on the end, and they're fragile when you do it, so you have to be a little bit careful. But anyways, um, there's a lot of different things you can do here. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting here, let me go see if I can... Uh, okay. If you make some standards yourself, the difficulty in making them is really pretty. Here's a, here's a 50 ohm 50 ohm SMA uh, standard. Very very easy to, uh, to solder to the center pin. I cut the center pin off. I ground it flush, so it stuck out just about a sixteenth of an inch. I soldered to either side of the connector. It was easy to do. Soldered to the center pin. Cleaned the flux off. Uh, very easy to do. Um, the shorts. Are nothing more than a piece of real thin copper that's just soldered with. I put a little pinhole in the center of it, uh, if to let the whatever the lead coming out of the back of the connector is to barely fit, and um, solder it flush. Um, this this would I mean it, there's that's a flush one, that's a flush one. You can see a little bit of the pin sticking out there, and um, it's pretty easy to make them. The the opens I ground the pin either flush. Or really, for super super accuracy, the, the center pin needed to be ground just a teeny bit below. Um, but that's only if you're going up like a gigahertz. And when I say below, I mean like maybe only five thousandths of an inch below the the, the level here. So really, didn't need to go up much at all. Uh, be drill, be uh, uh, cut out much at all. So I wouldn't even worry about it. I just uh, you know grind it smooth like with a Dremel tool or something like that. Um, let's see. Oh, here's some interesting things. You can make you can make something like this be a um, an adapter for you. Notice what I've got down here. I've got two 100 ohm resistors across this printed piece of printed circuit board that fits you know fits in the BNC or not BNC fits in the um, banana slots here uh, with the standard three quarter inch spacing. So I can calibrate to this point right here by doing open, which is nothing, short, which is this one, and load, which is this one, and that works quite nicely. Here's a little jumper, um, which I know the uh, I know the effects of it as I bend it out 20 degrees and and 45 degrees and like 90 degrees. Here's a little adapter I built. It's a little circuit board I had fabbed that solders on the back end of an end connector. It's got a couple couple little micro um, 
screw terminals here and it's got a little place here and for calibrating it I just put a um, 0805 resistor here either 0 ohm 50 ohm and I put an open there and that works out extremely well um, this is not part of this was just a different picture I took from before this is a little Bluetooth adapter that actually lets me remote the uh, the network analyzer if I wish and uh, then I can hang it from an I can hang it from a wire up in the, you know in the air if I want if I'm running one on running run it on battery or something but um, these kind of little things allow you to make um, additional measurements pretty easily uh, most analyzers that allow you to calibrate to a reference plane allow you to save the calibration files saving the calibration files um, I have a calibration file for this adapter, I have a calibration file for this adapter, I have a calibration file, three of them for this one, based on how far the, uh, the leads are bent apart. So it's, you know, it's pretty easy to do, um, all, the, all this stuff. Um, one thing I would suggest, oh, I should have gotten that back here, hang on for a second. A very simple thing to do is to take this and bend these wires down to they're almost parallel just solder them onto a resistor, on the ends of a resistor, pick a resistor, say it's 150 ohm resistor, and see if you're capable of getting your network analyzer to read 150 ohms um, by doing what I, what I, what I proposed in the, um, with Sim Smith. There's a, an awful lot of experimenting here you can do, but you have the ability now to go make a component, make it a size you want, and go and prove whether you have the ability to make the measurement accurately or not. If you don't have the ability to make the measurement accurately, um, get in touch with me and tell me what you did. And there's probably some really obvious thing, but uh, for the most part, this is a very easy way um, to get pretty accurate measurements. It's a lot of fun, and it, uh, it, it's very useful because uh, if I make a measurement like this, I put it into SimSmith, the answer I get when I'm done, almost 100% of the time is perfect. And if it's not perfect, it's, it's close enough that it's... It, I mean, it's pretty scary how, how well it works. Anyways, hope everyone enjoyed this. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, let me know, let me know if you, um, you know, give me, give me a suggestion if you'd like some other video here before I finish up the basic series.